I think we're good to go. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the panel is the Alchemy of Finance, Portfolio Construction Strategies. And we have with us very experienced alchemists, each with a slightly different uh, primary focus on their elixir. And um, we look forward to a robust discussion today. And we'll go through um, some questions and then leave time for Q&A and additional topics, time permitting. On your far right is Stephen Toy, Stephen's Senior Managing Director and co-head of WL, WL Ross & Company. Next to him is Brian Pellegrino. Brian is the Chief Investment Officer of UPS. Next to Brian is Hua Fan. Hua is Senior Managing Director and Head of Fixed Income Absolute Return Strategies for the China Investment Corporation. And on my right um, is Tim Hayward, Investment Director and Head of Fixed Income for GAM. And on the far, um, and your far left, is Jane Buchan. Jane is CEO of PAMCO and also chair of the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst Association. Um, in addition to having multiple elixirs, the panel here also represents um, home bases out of three continents. So we have a lot of great and robust perspectives today. We're going to start by talking about asset allocation. And it's obviously very critical. We're in uncharted territory and a lot of the traditional um, ways of looking at portfolios um, are challenged, and everybody is spending a lot of time seeking to navigate that well. We thought we'd kick off um, first by having each panelist just give a quick background on themselves, and then Brian will give a sense of, under his stewardship, where he's taken UPS from when he came in. So if you want to start, maybe Stephen and then Brian can pick up right after we get through the additional intros. Sure, terrific. Thank you, Jennifer, and, and thank you all for, for attending. Mm -hmm. So uh, Stephen Toy, Senior Managing Director, co-head of, uh, of WL Ross, uh, a founding member of the firm which we uh, established in, in 2000. So, so WL Ross uh, is a private equity firm based out of New York. We have about $7 billion of assets under management, and um, we focus on, on, on the value-oriented side of, of private equity. So really four primary uh, investment strategies, uh, opportunistic buyouts, uh, distressed and, uh, and turnaround situations, real assets, and, uh, and special situations. Good morning. Brian Pellegrino, uh, Chief Investment Officer of the UPS Group Trust. Um, we manage 30 billion in assets for four defined benefit trusts, all of which have open plans. A relatively young workforce, which leads to long duration liabilities and a very low payout ratio. Uh, so we invest for the long term and it allows us to do some things uh, that our peers may not be able to do. I'm Hua Fan from China Investment Corporation. Uh, CIC is uh, China's sovereign wealth fund. It was uh, established back in 2007. Um, it's uh, following um, long-term asset allocation similar to other big institutional investors. So we have uh, um, a broad range of our products. We invest in like um, public equity, fixed income, private equity, hedge funds, um, infrastructure, real estate, um, and natural resources. Uh, I focus primarily on the absolute portfolio which includes uh, hedge funds and uh, um, like multi-asset multi, pro uh, multi products, uh, which accounts for 12% of the total portfolio. So my name is Tim Hayward. I look after fixed income for GAM, about $30 billion. Um, our major focus is really absolute return or unconstrained investing, very much like much of GAM's uh, uh, investment offerings. Um, and Jane Buchan, I'm CEO of PAMCO. We are a hedge fund of funds, but unlike most, we keep complete control of the assets and work with managers to try to get really great performance by trade-offs. Great. Brian? Sure. So prior to the financial crisis, we ran a fairly plain vanilla typical corporate pension allocation, equities, fixed income, and a small allocation to alternatives. Um, after the financial crisis, we started transition into a portfolio m designed more to meet the specific needs of our liability stream. And so I'd like to focus on that over the next few minutes. And if we could just bring up the slide, we can work through it. So what I'd like to do, if we just start with the equity portfolio, 
Um, actually, if we back up, if you look at the outer ring, it looks like a very traditional portfolio allocation. The big change from prior to 2008 to today, less public equity, higher allocation to alternatives. Uh, but it's really what's happening inside on the inner circle of the pie chart that makes a difference. So when we think about equity, we think about how do we, what is the best way to capture um, the equity risk premium? And that points us more to that uh, pie of custom beta strategies. Our active management is very highly concentrated, high conviction managers that are benchmark agnostic and have a wide, uh, a wide band on where to invest our assets. Um, when we think about fixed income, it's all about duration and credit spreads. And so the long duration portfolio is 50% uh, long corporates and 50% city strips. And we tactically move between the two based on where we think valuations are and the opportunity set. Uh, we've also added return seeking, which is high yield, emerging market debt, global bonds, and some bank loans. Uh, that helps to uh, diversify the income stream and also bring duration down when needed. Uh, private debt is a new allocation. It was sprinkled throughout the portfolio. Uh, and we are trying to get that under one umbrella. It was in our, our core fixed income. It was in our uh, private equity. It was in real estate. It was in alternatives. And we're now trying to bring that together to get a better handle. The liquid alternatives is uh, just fundamentally diversifying uh, return stream, uh, pushes us to global macro, a lot of bespoke opportunities. Uh, and we also do our tail risk hedging out of that portfolio. Private equity and real estate are, uh, have been evolving into a theme of what we deem getting closer to the assets. Uh, so uh, that puts you more in secondaries and co-invest opportunities. Uh, and we like to underwrite specific assets because it gives us more clarity on the return stream. And then we hold cash. We probably hold a higher allocation to cash, not because of our liquidity needs, but because we like to be opportunistic. And if our partners bring us opportunities, and they look good for our portfolio, we'd like to be able to close quickly. Great, terrific, and thank you. I think, Jane, you're also running some long duration and liability-driven portfolios, and maybe a sense of how you're running those. And yeah, so one of the things that's happened is we're a hedge fund of funds, and so what are we doing in long duration or liability-driven investing? And what we're seeing, particularly with the large plan sponsors, which is most of our client base, is that people are looking at hedge funds and are looking through in a pass-through sense as to what things are. So for example, one of the big issues is there's a lot of pressure on these corporate pension plans to match the liabilities and the assets, um, particularly on a financial reporting basis. But it's a very expensive proposition to go buy long bonds now at these current rates. And so when you look at the shape of the curve and you know our background, or at least my background in fixed income, Swaptions are a derivative structure that you can get the uh, positive duration exposure if rates go down, but you're not going to have the same losses if rates go back up. And most actuaries will say that that's a better hedge than anything else. The problem is, is they're expensive. You know, depending on how you structure it, you know, they often are 75 basis points, and you can't go to a traditional fixed income manager and say, how are you going to make up for this really ideal hedge? So what we've got uh, are clients who will get really risk averse uh, hedge fund portfolios, and particularly hedge fund portfolios that have a negative correlation to rates to fund a swap option portfolio and then appear the, the overall plan. And so what you're getting is things that start at the micro level down in the hedge fund bucket becoming overall portfolio construction strategies. Any other comments? Sure. I, I, from, from the private equity side of things, I, I think it's a, a really interesting period of time when you think about asset allocation and, and, and you think about the investable universe and, and, and where at least um, our world fits in. So you know, if, you, if you think about a plan and, and, and you have a, a target rate of, of 7 or 8 percent, and you compare that to what is the investable universe today, well, you have you know, treasuries or, or sub 2 percent, you have uh, high grade corporates at 3 and a half, high yield at uh, six and a quarter, and you have public equities, which, you know, looking at the S&P 500 today is trading at a, a P-E ratio north of 20 versus the, the historical trend of, of 15 to 16. That being said, so the headline in private equity is not particularly interesting either. Um, you know, you look at 2014, 
average purchase price of, of a buyout was, uh, was 10.7 times EBITDA, which is well above pre-crisis levels. Um, those were financed with about six and a half turns of, of leverage, so pretty aggressive uh, capital structures, and, and therefore, um, you know, deals that are taking on more risk. You know, what's driving this? I, I think everyone uh, is seeing what's going on in, in the landscape and, and what's driving it. So, so our firm was established in 2000. You know, comparing 2000 to where we are today, the number of GPs participating in private equity is up a little over threefold. The amount of AUM in private equity is, is up uh, over fivefold. So, so, so much more competition in the market in addition to competing with you know, the capital markets, which are more open today than they were uh, several years ago as, as an alternative uh, source of, of capital for businesses. Uh, and we're competing against uh, the corporates, which have built up, built up large cash balances. And, and now we're using m a as a means of growth, as, as, as the global economies have, have been uh, relatively stagnant. So you know, with that backdrop, though, you know, as, as a value-oriented private equity player, you know, what we look for are situations where the headline is not particularly interesting, and we think private equity broadly, the headline is not particularly interesting, um, but where the fine print may be. So, so, so where's that taken us in, in terms of how we manage our portfolios? If you look at so the beginning of, of 2014 to, to where we are today, um, we, we've primarily been taking advantage of the markets but by liquidating assets. So, so, so we've sold a little over 2.2 billion of assets out of our portfolio. We've reinvested uh, a little bit less than a billion dollars into new investments. Um, that being said, while the broader industry's been you know, at a purchase price multiple of, of 10.7 times, we've been able to create our new investments in that time period in around six times EBITDA. And we do, we do think that's you know, an interesting place to be to deliver you know, returns in the asset allocation spectrum, you know, in a world where much of the investable universe we think is um, is relatively uh, uninteresting. Yeah. To that end, so I think if why don't we um, talk a little bit about the hedge fund strategies maybe first, and then we'll go back to the the fixed income at the other end of the the curve, which is driving a lot of um, the repositionings <laughs> that we're seeing. So, Hua, would you like to speak a bit about how you're uh, constructing your portfolio at CIC? Sure. Um, the way we approach absolute portfolios uh, uh, is starting with uh, actually beta. And the goal for our absolute return portfolio is to generate uh, good risk-adjusted returns. And our return target is a little bit more realistic uh, since we're established after the financial crisis. Um, uh, so it's kind of a LIBOR plus six type of uh, return target. And then we actually have have uh, built um, like a beta portfolio starting with like risk parity and uh, that's sort of our starting point. We, uh, we started by giving money to external managers and then right now we run the big portion internally as well. And then we have been using uh, the hedge fund uh, managers to help us uh, gain access to various alpha. It's probably a broader sense. Um, some people would call a certain part of it smart beta or dumb alpha. Um, but also there are good managers that generate and correlated it, a very good quality alpha as well. Um, so it ranges from um, like liquidity, long short, uh, relative value, um, event driven credit, as well as uh, um, like a CTA type of strategies. Um, um, so it's a pretty wide range of things we do. And then we, in terms of the way we uh, look at managers, we definitely emphasize on manager selection. That's where we have seen consistent value add from our team. And also, we, uh, we emphasize a lot on uh, low correlation returns. Um, um, for example, insurance-linked product will be one area that gives you an uh, uncorrelated return with the financial markets. Uh, and then also, we focus on risk allocation. Sometimes uh, you will see uh, managers, once they get too large, they probably don't take as much risk as you can. Um, so we would encourage them to take more risk in that sense. And those discussions go well. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Great. And Jane, maybe some comments from you in terms of how you've, um, both how you, the role in portfolio that your clients are utilizing hedge funds for, as well as the, how you're constructing your strategy and how that'll vary across mandates. Yeah. So, I mean, we're kind of different. And so trying to make it more applicable to people is that we focus on the small managers. Our clients are massive retirement um, programs, and so it makes sense for them to do most things directly if they're appropriately resourced, which most of them are. And we 
keep control of the assets, we have full position level transparency, so we're able to do global risk management rather than, than um, and so one of the key issues for us is, and you see this, for example, you can have a long short equity manager who comes in and trades small to mid cap, and then you get a capital, or to larger cap, and then you get a capital structure person who comes in and they do across the cap. And then when you look at the portfolios, you get you know 15% that overlap. And so then the real, really important dialogue becomes who's, who's really better at trading that space, how do you want to modify that, and how do you want to pick it up? And I don't know if this is a good or a bad comment, but what we've found is the amount of alpha we're able to add through what I would call um, just better operations equals the alpha we can add by picking managers and strategies. <laughs> so I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, but, but I think one of the things that I'm seeing across plans across the in, is doing this in hedge funds, but then also taking this across where you do it traditionally through equities and through fixed income is to really look at the marginal trade-off between managers and where their skill sets fit together. Right, and Tim, so Tim has the um, mandate of uh, capital preservation and enhancement and utilizes all the tools that are out there. So it's obviously the base that's been most challenged in many ways from the traditional model and thought it would be wonderful to hear some comments on how you're, um, how you're navigating this, managing sure. it, and then the perspectives you see. Yeah, it's, I suspect most uh, asset managers uh, start off by trumpeting their asset class and then secondly telling you why they're particularly good at their asset class. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start off by giving a major risk warning about my asset class and, and <laughs> hopefully persuade some that we're quite good at, at dealing with the potential shocks. Uh, I mean, fixed income's had a 30-year bull run. I mean, I'm sure most people in the audience are incredibly aware of that. The uh, terrible asymmetry that is facing us going forward, the lack of worry about preservation of capital from a simple long-only perspective, the quality of income that is available uh, is pretty, uh, um, high quality income is very expensive and low quality income, well even that's pretty uh, pretty uh, low yielding at the moment. The sort of homogeneous uh, nature of credit spreads notwithstanding what's available in the private space but mostly it's a pretty poor um, asset class. So it's a, it's a question is do we sell, do we short, uh, do we, what can we switch into? It's not good for my career to say that actually equities will probably outperform bonds um, but uh, that is still a core call of ours. Um, uh, but uh, before I get into, into the weeds, I think it's just to say that this asset class is seriously troubled uh, and I really encourage people who haven't already thought about it to uh, adopt some, some quite novel techniques to protect. So speaking of that, I, we, we, we know of a lot of the issues and how about a little bit of joy from opportunities as well. Um, <laughs> everybody is um, across the, the panel here has different, maybe we want to start with Brian where you're overweight, underweight, allocating new capital. Sure. So um, as a corporate pension that's forced to hold long duration fixed income, Tim, you make me feel really good right now. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. But, you know, we look within asset classes primarily. So coming out of the financial crisis, we were um, significantly overweight in domestic equity relative to global portfolio. Um, we have slowly rotated to where we made our last move earlier this year, and we are now overweight, developed international and emerging markets relative um, to a global benchmark. So we think that that will be beneficial for us. Uh, likewise, we were overweight duration coming out of the financial crisis, and now we are overweight long corporates. Um, the, when we started to rotate in, the, the spread on long corporates was 198 basis points, I think. Um, and the 30-year, which is our treasury benchmark, was trading somewhere around 242 at the time. So. Um, it, it's really just building a better portfolio and giving yourself the best opportunity set. Uh, new allocations, uh, we like insurance length, we're looking at that. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on alternative betas uh, that are diversifying to the overall portfolio. Uh, and then we spend time looking for really unique ideas. Um, we're, we're actually exploring litigation finance right now. Um, as a diversifying income stream because it doesn't correlate to the broad equity or fixed income markets. Great. 
I think it's just a, a follow-up to that, that discussion, Brian. We would love to hear your thoughts. You know, I, we, we talked a little bit about the, the landscape of, of private equity, and, and you know, we're not unique in terms of being a manager who's been selling a lot more than, than, than mm -hmm. investing. So you know, if you look at distributions from the space, we had a record in 2013, about $330 billion. Uh, 2014, we topped that, raised the bar by another 30%. Um, how, how do you think about that in, in what you know the, the, the allocation pie you had and, and, and how you think about where private equity fits in your uh, in your allocation? Private equity is a, is a var very valuable contributor to the overall success of the portfolio. Um, it is tracking since inception in the high teens, uh, very high teens net returns. Uh, so when you need to achieve eight, seven, five, high teens looks pretty good. Um, the concern we have right now is that you're approaching the period that you saw just prior to the financial crisis, um, where private equity firms are able to raise significant amount of capital. Uh, I would go one further and say there really is no fundraising for the good managers. They just notify you that they're coming to market. You put your allocation in and hope it doesn't get cut back to a not meaningful allocation for your portfolio. Um, we would like to see, and there's a lot of discussion about fees and performance, I think the, the, the differentiator would be the ability to commit capital in t today to good managers and not have to pay fees on committed capital. Just pay on drawn. Because if you commit capital a man, in an overvalued market, a manager feels compelled to make investments that are less than optimal. And if you're an investor and they're not doing that and they're being prudent and holding that money for the right opportunity, that's a tremendous drag because you're paying fees on unproductive capital. Yeah. We'll come back a little bit later to the alignment of interest questions as well <laughs> um, and different strategies that people have. Um, do you feel there's different philosophies too on when a lot of distributions are coming back? Do you want to keep your pacing consistent as long as the opportunity set is there? Or do you have a sort of lean in, lean out, positioning we for learned, those new commitments. We, we learned our lesson coming um, out of the financial crisis. So 2005, 2006, 2007, we were chasing allocation. Our commitments were getting larger and larger. And then we wound up in 2008 with a significant amount of unfunded capital. And what happens is the managers come around and they say, look, history tells you these are the best vintage years, uh, those following a downturn, and you should be continuing to put capital to work and the allocation will right itself over time. Um, and what we found was, look, you have our uncommitted capital. It doesn't matter to us whether it's vintage 2006 or vintage 2009 or, or 2010. Put that capital to work when you see the opportunities. And so our unfunded, had, we've been working that off for five years now. And you know, we'll, we'll manage that appropriately th based on what we think the opportunity set in the market is. So we'll be patient in putting private equity to work, but it doesn't mean we're going to abandon the asset class. Great, great. So speaking of opportunities, Stephen, maybe a few thoughts in terms of the areas that you're focusing and dedicating more of the resources. Yeah, sure. So, so I'll hit a couple, a couple of current opportunities we're spending a lot of time on, um, and perhaps some, some future ones that we're, uh, we're we're just penciling out right now. But uh, uh, we we raised two uh, two recent vehicles that, that that are targeted to two two sectors. Probably unsurprisingly, one is energy, um, but we are looking at energy. I, I think a bit differently, and, and we can talk through kind of how we're, we're, we're structuring. Um, not just our views on it, but also how we're structuring the mm -hmm. capital, which is a little bit different. But, but in, in our view, there is a, a very large opportunity in energy. We think it's, it's, it's primarily a credit opportunity today. We think it eventually morphs into an equity opportunity where, where um, more classical distress for control uh, type situations um, will materialize. We, we don't see that today. We're really playing it more on the credit side at the moment. And you know, we think the way, at least the way we're viewing the opportunity is, is, is marrying up you know, private equity style sort of diligence and, and, and analysis to, um, to credit expertise. And we think you need both. So you know, to, to, to really buy into, to understand what you're buying into in, in the capital structure of, of you know, an EMP business, really need to understand the technical aspects of the business, the geology underlying 
uh, the business and, and, and have a view on, on the business model and management team. So, so when we buy a bond in, in, in energy, you know, we, we have private equity style modeling, private equity style diligence behind it before we even buy a single bond. And, and we look to marry that up with, with credit expertise because energy uh, as a sector, you know, really is, is one whereby they traded off structural protection for, for pricing. So, so when you look at the bond indentures of, of many of these companies, when you look at, in certain cases, the, the credit agreements uh, for these companies, they leave the investor with, with uh, far less protection than you would normally see in, uh, in these situations. And, and therefore, understanding both you know, what protections you, you do or, or in many cases you, you don't have, but, but again, sort of putting a, a, a private equity hat to it. And sort of, you know, we normally sit on the debtor side of the indenture, so understanding if, if we had to live with this indenture, what would be our next moves? If, if we became capital constrained, if we had to deal with the capital markets, you know, what would we look to do? Would we turn out our revolver? Would we look to layer the bonds? You know, what are the suite of alternatives that we have in front of us, and which ones do we think are actionable and, and why? So, so, so it gives us, I think, a, a, a good perspective on um, you know, what some of these businesses may do from, from a, a capital standpoint. Um, the other opportunity that, that we're spending a great deal of time on today is, is the continued disintermediation of the, of the financial system um, you know, due to regulation, what, whether it's uh, Basel, whether it's Dodd-Frank, Volcker, but we're seeing you know, classic financial institutions leaving many sectors. Um, we recently raised a, a pool of capital over in Europe that is a, uh, an Irish real estate mezzanine fund. So as we've seen, the traditional banks in, in Ireland pull back in terms of their providing capital uh, into commercial real estate uh, properties. Uh, we have found an opportunity to, to come in with, with a, a mezzanine tranche whereby you know, we're lending in that 60 to 80 percent LTV. We're earning, you know, called a high single digit uh, current yield and a low to mid teens all in yield with, with about a 20 percent. Uh, equity buffer below us. And, and we think in, in, in this market, that, that's a pretty attractive risk return profile. So, so those are uh, a couple of opportunities that, that we're very uh, active on today. Um, I think a little bit further out, we are spending um, a lot more time uh, in and around Japan and, and looking at, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a geography that we were very active in in the early 2000s, haven't been active there in, in probably five or eight years now. Um, but when, when, when we talk about, again, looking at the landscape, the amount of competition there is in private equity, that's one of the geographies that, that, that is far less competitive than, than, than what we're seeing in, uh, in the U.S. or, or in Europe. And, uh, and we're spending a, a good amount of time there. And then lastly, one of the sectors that we've historically been in and out of is, uh, is metals and mining and, and, and sort of those general commodities. And, and clearly, when you look at uh, uh, bulk and base metals, when you look at coal, when you look at a lot, a lot of these uh, segments, they've been, uh, you know, they, they've, they've tracked very closely, in fact, the, the, the oil markets. And, and we're seeing um, a, a great deal of, of dislocation that's starting to translate into distress. And, and we're just now um, you know, starting up on, on, on where we want to position ourselves. Great. And Jane, maybe a few comments from you also on where the opportunities are in the portfolio and where um, is the hedge funds and the PE will play in different aspects of the yeah. same risk spectrum. One of the classical mistakes um, that we try really hard not to make, but we still make it sometimes, is you hear all the press about whether markets are attractive or not attractive, but that's on a long only basis. And so, for example, as um, we were talking about earlier, um, we made a tremendous amount of money going long short in China when most people were writing about the Chinese market collapsing, and it was collapsing on a long only basis. And so, one of the things that once you move to more hedging sort of strategies, is you have to really look at these things um, and try to set aside your long oriented conceptions. Um, sometimes they do go together. You know, and there's certain sort of trades and strategies where you have to look at it together. But we've often found that a lot of the really great um, opportunities are when you've got a long only perspective that may be very accurate and very correct um, 
about, about a situation. And so they automatically write off a hedge-based strategies. And so that's one of the things that you have to be really careful about in our perspective from looking up on it. Um, in our space, I would agree with Stephen strongly on the debt side. Um, people seem to have thrown out all the energy companies, the baby with the bathwater. Um, uh, we're not bold enough to be directional in energy. That's beyond our purview. But you can find some really, really nice uh, situations where you can go long and short in the debt, and I would agree with that. And then um, we've actually made a lot of money in Europe. And so this would be an example of everyone's worried about Greek exit and everything else. And we're actually printing a lot of money in Europe right now. Yeah. So maybe to pick up on that. Yeah. <clears throat> you may detect my accent. I have <laughs> an interest. Um, uh, I'm just interested to know that, uh, that the opportunity sets includes litigation, finance, and Irish mezzanine real estate funding. I mean, uh, this is is, is a, a reflection of the lack of opportunities yes. in anything core. <laughs> Absolutely, um, and uh, I'm not in any way denying uh, that, that these are great opportunities, and you know, and uh, but it's it's it really shows the paucity of opportunity, uh, and that the, uh, the elephant in the room, besides me, is the um, is this uh, is the terrible level of yields that are available in Europe. Uh, simply put, I think Europe is overowned, um, overvalued. And, uh, and, and is prone to a, a fall. You've heard my boss say that at the opening session. Um, the capital commitments to Europe on the fixed income sides are record highs. The duration for those people who have committed uh, capital uh, to uh, is, is, is particularly long and towards the periphery. Uh, the reverse is true in the US, which is, relatively speaking, the best value it's been for 15 years against the European markets. Uh, and is uh, speculators are short, and uh, JP Morgan reporting uh, that the duration position is generally underweight. So you know, I think what we should be doing is, is almost a barbell strategy. We should be moving uh, what cash you have, cash assets you have towards the US long bond. Uh, you know, the long bond never rallies 20% year after year. It's 24% it's, it's last year. It's unlikely to do 24% this year. But if anything's going to rally, I think it's the US market because the disappointment is just coming through in the US, uh, whereas the excitement is coming through in Europe. Uh, so I know European equities are on fire. And uh, so, what am I saying? I think, look, it's, it, you know, it's time to say thank you very much and goodbye to credit in most situations, <laughs> barring litigation, finance, and uh, et cetera. Um, but you know, it's done a brilliant job. It's seriously uh, troubled. If you like a company, buy the equity. Um, uh, it's a great time to be a treasurer and a miserable time to be a fund manager. Um, <clears throat> and really focus uh, that long duration piece, which I'm still staring at the chart down here, you know, into, the, into some sort of protection. Uh, it's most likely to lose money. But in the event of a crisis, I think the US stands more likely to make money uh, going forward than other government bond markets. And did we think we'd, these levels would be looking pretty interesting, too? Well, every, I mean, every, this time every year, well, actually go back to January, almost the economists say the yield's about to rise, and, and that is being pushed back and back and back. We had the vote in the very first session when uh, I think it was surprising to Gillian Tett that, uh, that so many people put their hands up for next year or the end of the year, where most people were thinking it was going to be June now it's September, and it's been pushed back. And the latest consumer confidence, I think, just reinforces that view. Yeah. I, I think it's um, two points I'd like to make. Combined with the lack of opportunities, or maybe one of the drivers of the lack of opportunities in today's market, um, is how much liquidity is in the system right now and the wealth that has been created. I think in this weekend's Wall Street Journal, uh, and forgive me if I don't get the numbers exact, but in 2000, Global wealth was somewhere around 112 or 117 trillion dollars, and it ended 2014 at 263 trillion. Um, and where does that money go? Where you know, good opportunities are unloved assets, but when there's that much money floating in the system, it's very difficult to find opportunities that no one else is looking at or no one else finds attractive. And then when you throw on top of that, the fact that you have very low rates and you can obtain credit at very cheap levels, um, it's, a very, it's just a very difficult environment. And I think managers have to continue to evolve and look for new opportunities and be creative like the way you're approaching energy, Steve and Jane's um, you know, hedging opportunities. That's the way we deal with fixed income. We have to hold the treasuries. So we take the opposite side of a traditional pension hedge, which would buy the receiver, sell the payer uh -huh. to finance it. Uh, we'll hold the treasuries, we'll buy the payer. Yeah. 
and if rates go up, we, our funded status goes up and we don't feel the same level of pain of rising interest rates on a core fixed income portfolio. That put call parity is really worth mm -hmm. something. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Absolutely. Before we open up for questions, Hua has some interesting perspectives from China as well in opportunities and growth. Sure. Well, sitting in Beijing and being a global investor, um, I'm really excited about the opportunities in China. The Chinese financial markets have developed dramatically. Uh, so the equity market uh, is probably 52 trillion RMB in market cap. And the bond market is probably second to US these days. Uh, and then they trade a wide range of uh, commodity products as well. And people being quite creative in coming up with uh, various ETFs and even tranche the, the funds. Um, like what we tranche CDOs here. Um, and then the government has been quite committed to uh, open up the financial markets. So it's better access now. Um, it's easier to get QV quotas. And then um, also they started this uh, Hong Kong China Connect. Uh, so it's much easier for foreigners to invest in China. Um, and then um, in terms of uh, the opportunities, I do see there's a huge amount of uh, uh, beta already played out. But the alpha is still there because it's a market fast moving. Uh, you have a big um, portion of a retail volume there. And then you also um, have a fast growing like in, in investor base in China. And so altogether, I mean, it sort of drew people's attention there. For example, you can see um, there's a big wave of um, uh, public uh, like mutual fund managers moving into hedge fund space. Uh, um, partly was driven by um, the, the compensation structure. Usually, I mean, let's, like what's has happened here, you probably have the best talent in the hedge fund world than the long only world. Uh, and the same thing is happening in China. Um, right now, um, it's over 5,000 uh, managers registered at the CSRC um, to, to uh, manage money for, for hedge fund. Because uh, for the investor side, they went through various wave, uh, waves of uh, investment. For example, uh, it was um, just public equities before 2007, and then they move on to real estate. And then for the past couple of years, real wealth management product or the trust products were the popular thing that gives you maybe 10% for very little risk there. But right now, all these options are gone, and people go back into public market again, or they're looking for uh, good managers to give them um, better risk adjusted returns. Um, so, for example, last year in 2014, the average uh, hedge fund return was 22 uh, percent. Well, you probably all know uh, HFRI give you maybe 3 uh, percent. So that's definitely a huge uh, difference. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So um, while being CIC, uh, we would like to really bridge the gap between the West and the East. And then hopefully, if you guys are interested in Chinese managers, we're happy to um, I mean, let you know uh, the, the, the details. I mean, we know some managers, but we can really directly invest in the be denominated uh, products. Uh, and also, we see huge demand for Chinese investors to invest overseas. Mm -hmm. Great. It sparked some rich discussions. Are there any questions? It's hard for us to see up here. Well, actually, that's a little better. Any questions from the audience on? Yes, sir. Well, I'll just, um, and for Brian, thank you very much to the panel. But Brian, could you just make one comment that sort of the voice in the back of my head went off? And that was your comment about the, I think it was the, um, private debt, I think you said it was relatively, a relatively new allocation. Uh, and I think if I understood you correctly, the comment you were making was, in your own mind, from a portfolio construction context, where did it belong? I think you said, uh, I think it, it was three or four sort of. So I just thought maybe you could just, and then you mentioned I want to get, you know, get a better handle on it. So to me, that just sort of struck me as sort of a, a, a remark about which, which is interesting, right? Is uh -huh. In this new environment, where does it really belong? How do you look at it and how you evaluate it? Thank you. So, so sure. Um, we've had private, uh, just to be clear, we've had private debt in the portfolio. Uh, it, was it was primarily a part of a private e traditional private equity allocation, uh, either under MES or special situations. Um, but consistent with what the discussion has been this morning, as opportunities get scarce, managers start to do different things, right? So you know what a traditional lockup on a hedge fund manager is until they come back and say, I have this opportunity and I want your capital for three years, right? Or you have a fixed income manager um, in a very low yielding environment that is now looking for opportunities and so they're, they're doing private debt structures that are locked up five years, six years, seven years. 
And so what you wind up is a lot of crossover from your traditional asset classes and um, with different allocation mandates, right? So the amount of money we put, to get, we put out on a single investment in private equity is different than the amount of money we put out in a single investment in a core fixed income portfolio that's 30% of the portfolio. So what we tried to do is just bring that all together and look at it holistically, regardless of what the structure was of that investment, so that we now know, and a, a key component of that gives us the ability to manage our unfunded, right? Which grows very quickly if it's sprinkled throughout your portfolio. But now you'll have a mandate that we never want unfunded and private debt to be greater than X. And so that's how it helps us going forward. Any other questions? Or, or Stephen, yeah, I'll, I'll follow up to that a little bit as well because our, our strategy straddles sort of debt and equity in, 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 in terms of what we've seen and in, in where we get allocated, right? <coughs> We've got different vehicles that on one end of the spectrum, I'd say, starts at, uh, you know, at, at stressed debt, so, so call it low, uh, low teens, you know, into special situations, quasi equity, which is, uh, you know, high teens, and then into distressed and, and private equity, which is a traditional. 20% plus. So if, you, so if you think of that spectrum, so we're, we're, we've seen sort of the pools of capital come into our vehicles. So sort of in, in that stress debt, it's, it's generally in the opportunistic fixed income bucket. As you move over into the special situations, it's, it's sort of that pure opportunistic bucket. And then um, sort of the uh, private equity slash distress bucket when we get into the, the more 20% uh, type. Uh, return vehicles. So, so that, that's usually the spectrum that we see. Does anyone actually on that point have comments? And I think, you know, not as much just specific to credit, but also with um, Jane and Tim, where you've seen the use of your offerings um, have different roles in portfolio. And then maybe for anyone on the portfolio, I mean, we see this in our business as well, what it takes to really ensure that as an organization, you're set up to invest in and understand these opportunities at the seams of the buckets, if you will. And any perspectives on any of that? I mean, for just one minute, I mean, what we're seeing is um, we're not unique in terms of being a large institutional investor taking control of assets in the hedge fund space. And we're seeing a lot of big um, portfolios do that where the information systems and the dialogue with the manager is a lot closer to that of traditional land rather than what I would call alternative land, which is you wire your money away and, and don't talk because they're illiquid. And so, and we're also seeing, I mean, this is what we do, but we also seen a lot of other people do this, is when they think about hedge funds, they're thinking more about the manager's core competences and how that fits into their overall asset allocation mix rather than this is the manager's product and where do I put the manager's product? I mean, it's a very different way of thinking about it. And so you think about who you want taking what risks for you as firms rather than um, this is the product and do I want to buy the product? Absolutely. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think it's, um, it's amazing the, 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 the reach you have to take. I think uh, finding a 2% income is relatively easy. I think 4% is getting quite complicated. It's the greatest risk uplift for a modest increase in, in, uh, in income. And then you go to the distressed. Uh, triple C is now yielding 17%. Wow, that's a lovely big number. Uh, yeah, but the total return was minus 22 the last 12 months. So it does come with a serious health warning, OK? Uh, lots of income and no capital return, or, or basically capital shaving into your income and then some. So. Uh, I, we don't feel super confident about being lawyers. Um, you know, that's not our skill set. I leave that to others on the panel. Um, but that reach for yield has never been so pernicious as it has been uh, now, yeah. in my view. Absolutely. Are there other questions? And otherwise, oh, please. I got a mic right here. Okay. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Juliana Glover. I'm a corporate consultant from Washington, D.C. You all have mentioned. Um, litigation finance a couple times. And I'm curious as to whether you all see activity in that space in other areas besides antitrust civil suits and um, patent infringement. And also just a little bit of a discussion on the overall marketplace, given that litigation is generally seen as a hole in a balance sheet. And um, it's fascinating to see it be viewed as a profit center for something other than law firms. The UK perspective, there are probably three or four firms who've uh, attempted to raise finance. It's, in the grand scheme of things, it's minuscule. 
uh, and it's very much nascent. I think it's much more developed over here. So I'll leave that yeah. to, so to well. if you want to say any more. We are, when I made that comment, I mean, we are in the infancy stages of that, and it was just one of many ideas that are being brought to us um, that are value, potentially value add in this environment. So it's not something that we're currently doing, or, or really I have a lot of insight on how that would work. It's just really, a, the point was p uh, managers are getting creative to find ways to bring value to their clients, which are asset allocators. That was the main point I was trying to make. Yeah. Great. Yes. So just at a high level, with um, the new regulatory regime, uh, we have prop desks of large banks being repositioned and entering the market with risk premium type strategies, hedge fund beta. Uh, so I'll just repeat real quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, in the new regulatory regime, we see many of the banks repositioning their proprietary desk operations and coming to market through swaps with risk premium hedge fund based type strategies. I'm just curious what the, uh, what the panel's thoughts are on those. If it works, they call it a hedge fund. If it doesn't, they call it risk premium yeah. strategies. <laughs> <laughs> We've done a lot in capturing that data because yeah. obviously we're sold to all the time on that and the performance, you know, not saying that there isn't something somewhere that's good, but by and large, it's pretty bad. <laughs> I, I, <clears throat> I think you're willing to pay for value add. Um, and so an analogy is if you have a really good manager with a long track record of creating value for your fund, fees should not really be a discussion. Uh, a new hedge fund that comes out and wants to command two and 20 for some strategy that when you do the analysis is really a factor equity beta, credit beta, uh, you know, you want that as cheaply as possible. And that's where alternative beta comes in because you don't have to put a lot of time and effort into understanding or monitoring a manager to make sure they stick to their strategy. So when we add hedge funds, we look, we run a factor model and we look for exposures that can't be explained by traditional factor analysis. And we're willing to pay for that. I also just want to add, uh, we have done some research in the space as well. Um, from our experiences of um, the uh, investment banks, they provide this type of product, but usually we don't see a sort of a, a consistent team behind it. Uh, so sometimes the turnover is high, you don't really have the same people managing it uh, a year from now. And then the other things, what Jay mentioned, the returns hasn't been compelling as well. Um, so in terms of the smart beta, we're still sort of in the research stage and, and possibly we're thinking doing something internally as well. Any other questions? Otherwise, we might talk a little bit of alignment of interest in its many forms and how the LP, GP, investor, asset owner relationship continues to evolve. Um, are there questions? I'm sorry. It's just tough. I think not. OK. Um, I'll take a minute. And yeah, I, great. I can start there. Um, so when we think about investing, we, we like to find partners that understand what our goals are and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and then we give them a lot of flexibility um, to design structures, um, find opportunities that fit our needs. Right? And I, I just go back and, and listening to Steve talk, um, you know, as a private equity manager and you're going, well, we want to play energy space, that's usually a buyout, that's lever, there, there's some trade there that creates value. And what they're looking at is something that is a more predictable outcome with an exit strategy if things don't go right. And so as an investor, that's valuable because um, you're getting a new look, you're, you're, you, you have an opportunity to, and the flexibility to invest across the capital structure where the opportunity exists at the current point in time. And, the, and also the flexibility to go back when it doesn't exist. And so if you add value, there, people are in business to make money. And if you add value, you should be compensated based on the amount of value you add, not based on the structure you function under. And just to follow up on that, I, I think you raise a, a great point there. And, and again, on the energy play, look, 
You know, it, it's clearly a dislocated space. You, you've got oil, you know, go from 110 in, into the 40s, now now into the mid 50s. Um, yeah, and, and we've set up this opportunistic pool, but nobody knows how long this opportunity will will be there, right? N nobody can predict where oil prices are going to be. In fact, if you look at the near-term forecasts, you know, the range is anywhere from you know in, in, into the 20s or into the 80s and, e and even 90, right? That, that, that is the definition of a dislocated market when, when that's the dispersion mm -hmm. of forecasts. So, so, so the way we've set up the, the vehicles for, for, for energy, and, and, and right along Brian's point, so, so we've set them up in, in separately managed accounts. Um, so, so, so they're not long lockups because we can't predict how long this market and how long the opportunity set is, is there. And so while it is available, we, we want to be able to invest. And you know, if we see that opportunity dissipate, we, we want to be able to unwind and, and move on to, to other things. So that, that is, a, a, I think, a good example of how, how we're trying to align ourselves with our partners, take advantage of an opportunity while it's there, but also, as, as, as Brian mentioned earlier, you know, not have committed capital when, when we just don't see the opportunity to deploy it. Um, one other thing, um, just on structure, at the risk of being a bit controversial, is um, I do agree that you want to pick the right people um, first and then kind of negotiate fees. But I mean, our, our clients are effectively retirement plans and they're in a bad funding situation and they need everything they can get. And one of the huge um, dislocations, one of my former partners um, has written a, a pretty a journal financial economics article about this. We have another um, friend of mine, used to be a professor who, who's also writing on this is there's a lot of places where you pay a lot of money for brand as opposed to performance. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think one of the healthy dialogues we try to have with some of our clients across the whole thing is there are times you really want to pay for brand, believe it or not, I would argue that. But there are other times that you probably don't really need to pay for brand. And I think that is a place to really get a better alignment for the benefit of whose assets you're managing in their trust. Absolutely. I think I, I would just like to play off of that. I, I think if you you look at your spend again as a pie chart, you can actually reduce fees. And I think Jane said they create a lot of value by reducing fees by reallocating that based on your needs. So taking where you don't need to pay for brand, don't pay, reduce your fees, and investing where you do need to pay because of unique strategies or a unique skill set or a, a superior level of talent within that firm. Okay. What about the move of external management, in-house management, hybrid models? And I'd also say, uh, particularly within the um, world of certain, um, I hate to call them hedge fund strategies, but hedge strategies that hedge funds pursue as well as private equity co-investments. And um, some comments maybe on those trends and and what you see to really um, be set up to do this right? Sure, maybe I'll start. Um, for our side, um, it's actually quite hard to get capacity with good managers. Uh, so what we focus on is, uh, um, I mean, by bringing in some of the strategies that with capacity longer term uh, internally. So we have uh, been running the risk parity strategy, but also a GTA strategy internally as well. Um, and then we have been quite open about it with our managers uh, of what we were going to do. Uh, we were actually concerned whether they were thinking about conflict of interest and others, but it seems like in the end they were very open about it, and then also they would like to build this long-term uh, partnership with us uh, so we sort of uh, um, can learn things together. Um, and then there's also benefit of uh, uh, doing internal and external together. By doing the internal uh, funds, and then we, our teams are more following the market, and then they understand what the managers go through. So actually, they eventually pick very good managers. Uh, and then. <laughs> So that's sort of the one thing. On the other hand, I mean, we do learn from the excellent uh, managers, the experts uh, uh, of the world, and then that sort of help us to build our own internal uh, process. I think co-invest is another um, topic that comes up frequently. I know allocators always ask for co-invest opportunities, and managers always grant co-invest opportunities. But the allocation of that capital is very difficult. and. Um, having an M&A background, 
having four or five partners in a diligence room trying to do their own diligence on a co-invest opportunity uh, becomes very onerous. Um, so you, you're limited, your co-invest opportunities are limited to your big allocators that can commit huge amounts of money and have in-house, this is the in-house expertise to diligence and opportunity very quickly. Um, and if you try to do that without the expertise, you just slow the process down or you risk um, you know, making bad investments. And so I, th I think that model will evolve over time as well. I absolutely agree with that. And then we've seen it evolve quite a bit already. So, so Co-Invest is, is um, very much a, a topic with, with our investors, you know, a, a greater and greater proportion of, of whom want to co-invest. And, and, and the key there is, is want. I, I think there's a, a very um, sort of wide uh, spectrum of, of, of capability. But, you know, it's, it's viewed as, as, as a way to, to blend down sort of fees and e economics. And, and, and we certainly understand that. And, and in fact, we have refine our process to, to work with our partners so that we, we do have a, a more formal um, and, and, and a uh, more structured uh, co-investment process. That being said, Brian's absolutely right in that it is tricky, right? You, you have time pressures, you have complexity pressures. You know, this comes at, a, at the tail end of, of a transaction where you have just a, a wide range of work streams that are all going on concurrently. And, and as you say, you know, then trying to manage multiple diligence processes on, on what you've done can, can be complicated. So we've tried to become more and more um, creative about how we work with, with our partners and, and be able to bring them into our transactions, A, because we see that's where the market's moving, B, because we use uh, co-investment very strategically and how we, we look at our own capital. So, so our model, is, as we talk about it internally, is, is a flexible capital model. And, and, and what that means is we've got various pools of, of capital that we can pull from. And therefore, again, as we look at the landscape, as we look at the competitive nature of, of our business, what we like to talk about internally is, is, is being neither constrained nor compelled by size. So, so, so we want to be able to do deals as, as small as you know, a $25 million equity check and still have that be meaningful for our fund, as large as you know, half a billion dollars plus, you know, in bringing multiple vehicles to the table, bringing in co-investors like Brian to the table. And if you look at the deals we've done in, in the last um, you know, 12 months, you know, the largest deal we did was, was a $600 million equity check. The smallest one we did was a $20 million equity check, you know, both of which were, were meaningful to our fund. And, and, and we think that's how, in this marketplace, you do find interesting opportunities because we, we don't want to limit ourselves to just one segment of the market. We want to look for you know, the most attractive risk return opportunities we can and build the capital around it. And Jane, you have experience. Anything to add on, um, you know, just more on the, the model itself? Um, on Covis or in general? I'm sorry. I was thinking the internal, external. Yeah, 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 the internal, yeah. external. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah. Okay. So we don't trade anything ourselves. Um, it would put us in terrible conflict, and we don't own any part of the managers. But we think a lot about how, what the managers are trading, and as I said, what the core competences are. And um, I would strongly encourage um, end user investors to really, really think and look through to the core competences and get away from the product definition yeah. because there are a lot of ways that you can customize things and the amount of dead weight loss overlap. That, that it's just I was shocked by the fact that, as I said, kind of running the system more efficiently produced you know, well over 100 basis points a year net of alpha. And I mean, that's a number most asset managers would kill for. And I think in terms of portfolio construction um, is something that we all strive to. Absolutely. Great. We were going to do a few lightning rounds, including the audience. If you're interested, it'll be a show of hands versus everybody here. Show of um, hands, which we can't see, by the way. I know. So I wonder <laughs> if we can dim the lights. But um, we'll all put our blinders on so we can actually see. But. How many actually would expect that when we look ahead five years, that this five-year um, return will be greater than 5%? I'm wish asset class. This is across the total portfolio, sorry. Got a few hands up there. We can do that. Great. Zero to 5%? Fewer hands. And what about zero negative returns? 
not too much worry about that. Oh, no, okay. no European sovereign investors in the room? <laughs> <laughs> and if you're looking at the strategies that you're taking to reposition your portfolios, how many are adding e-liquids currently? Great. Looking for new sources of alpha aggressively? <laughs> Levering diversified betas? Nope. Staying put? Too many. Raising cash? There we go. And increasing your focus on tail hedges? You're, uh, my hand's up. Interesting. <laughs> and changing your thoughts on currencies as well. OK, great. And how many people think that we're going to have a, a sustained, or we're going to enter a sustained sort of repricing of risk versus some violent bounce of volatility? So sustained repricing of risk within 2015. Bouts of volatility in 2015. Great. Interesting. And what will be the cause of those? Will it more likely come from the I'm going to suggest credit markets, equity markets, currency markets, or other. Credit markets? Credit. Liquidity. Pullback. Liquidity. And that, and that will come through all markets then. So the pullback of the market making liquidity or pullback of monetary policy. And all of the above. Too. And currency. Yeah. It's hard to differentiate them, actually. <laughs> How about the equity markets? No. Great. Um, any other comments in closing from any of our panelists? or? We're out of time. I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us, and please thank our panelists.